Hey guys, thank you for tuning in today. You know, this message that you're about to hear, I pray that it not only inspires you, but encourages you to follow Jesus even more. In fact, there are probably people in your life who need to hear this timely word, and chances are you're thinking about them right now. So share this message with them. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe. I also wanna thank all those who support us. We wouldn't have any ministry outside these four walls if it weren't for our friends who come alongside us in prayer and support us financially. There are thousands who are benefited by this ministry because of your giving, and we thank you. To continue or even start supporting our, our mission to help others and their families follow Jesus, you can give by visiting cfmiami.org slash give. Enjoy the sermon. Amen. Folks, what a powerful reminder, hey, that as we go through the battles of life, even when the enemy, what the enemy means for evil, our great God, he turns it for good. Come on, at all campuses, come on, let them hear it. Amen. Hey, well, Christ Fellowship family, it is always a joy to worship with you. Welcome. My name is Omar, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving as lead pastor here at Christ Fellowship. And uh, if you're a first-time guest right now, one of our local campuses, or maybe online, uh, thank you so much for joining us as we open up God's Word and to study it. Uh, today, actually, it's the third week, uh, the final and third week of a short marriage series called For God's Sakes Fight, specifically fight for your marriage. And I think it's been really great for our church just to kind of focus on our marriages for a few weeks. And uh, the title of today's message is How to Fight in Order to Rebuild the Marriage. And so, man, I'm excited to dive into God's Word. I hope you are as well. And so wherever you find yourself, let's open up our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. And you can follow along with me as I read, all right? Listen to what God's Word says. Now, there's Nehemiah speaking. Nehemiah said, and, writes, And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. And the wall of Jerusalem is what, church family? Broken yeah, it's broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. That is God's word. You can go and take a seat, everybody, at all campuses. And church, let me start off by sharing this with you. You know, growing up, I was blessed uh, to be able to travel all throughout Europe because my dad's side of the family all lives there. And so growing up, every summer, I would travel to Europe, and I, I've been able to, 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 to travel a lot. But it, one of the areas of the world that I've never traveled to is the Far East, specifically the country of China. And I said to myself, if I ever go to China, I would love to go visit the Great Wall of China. Now, folks, follow me here, because the Great Wall of China is considered one of the new seven wonders of the world. And, folks, when you go to it, the, you know, the reason that it's really considered one of the great wonders of the world is because it's one of the greatest human feats of, in human history in regards to construction. Now, the wall, get this, is 5,500 miles long. Yeah. And now, just for a perspective... It's the distance from right here in Miami, Florida, all the way to Alaska and beyond. So think about how long this wall is. And folks, this work began back in, seventh, in the 7th century B.C., and it continued for about 2,000 years. And the reason that it was built, it was to keep the enemy out and to protect the things they loved so much, which were their families. And folks, here's the thing. Once the wall was built, it was a beautiful thing to look at, right? It, it, it was something to behold. But folks, get this. After the wall was built, then the hard work really started. And, and I'm, referring to the, I'm referring to the hard work of rebuilding and re-strengthening the wall. 
You see, throughout the centuries, you know, it has a way of becoming weak and deteriorating and coming apart. You see, as the storms would come, as the cold winters would hit it, right, as the, as the heat of the summer, as all these things started to happen, the earthquakes, the fires, right, throughout the years, right, the wall, this beautiful strong wall that first started, right, as so strong, it began to come apart. And so at that juncture, there is a continual work on that wall to rebuild and re-strengthen the wall. Why? Because they want to make sure throughout the years that the thing that they cared about the most, right, their families were protected. And so after it was established, the hard work started of rebuilding and re-strengthening that physical wall. And folks, let me just bring that over to our time together because family, what an example of the walls of our marriages. And by that I mean that just like the Great Wall of China, right, was a beautiful thing to look at that moment that it was constructed. But throughout the years, right, there was hard work. There's hard work to rebuild and re-strengthen the wall just like that. And here's the main idea as we open up God's Word today. You know, folks, once the walls of our marriages were built, right, on that wedding day, it was a beautiful thing to look at. You know, the moment that a husband and wife, when a girl and boy, when they come together before their friends and before their families, right, and they, and on that special day, and you see those standing, it's a beautiful thing to see that new marriage full of love, full of excitement, full of hope. But get this, throughout the years, it's normal. It's normal for the walls of our marriages to become weak and become to start falling apart. You see, when the storms of life come your way, right, when the stresses of life, when the children comes, when the grandchildren comes, when financial issues come down the, the way of a, of, a, of a marriage, listen, here, get this, just like the bricks of the Great Wall of China began to come apart, listen, the bricks of our marriages, when all those things are hitting it, start to come apart. And so you see, as after a husband and wife come together on that wedding day, then comes the hard work throughout the years of rebuilding and re-strengthening the walls of our marriage. Amen? Amen? And who knows, maybe you're right now, you're sitting here and you're thinking, Omar, listen, I'm tracking with you. Because I think, I can, I, can, I can think back to that day that me and my spouse got married. And it was such a beautiful day. We were so in love. Things were so great. We were so optimistic about the future. But as I look at my marriage, man, throughout the years, throughout the decades, man, I've seen the bricks of my, of my marriage will start to come down. And it's become a shadow of what it used to be. And if I can be honest, Omar, I don't think our marriage developed the way that I wanted it to be. And so, Omar, I'm here today, and the reality is that I want to rebuild my marriage. I want to re-strengthen my marriage. And so what do we need to know, right, as the people of God, if we are going to re-strengthen, if we're going to rebuild our marriage, if we're going to have the marriages that God envisioned us to have, what do we need to know in order to rebuild, right, put the bricks back on the walls of our marriages? Well, folks, we're going to find out today from Nehemiah chapter 1, okay, and we're going to learn valuable lessons on how to rebuild the walls of our marriages from the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. So we're going to draw a lot of important concepts to help us rebuild our marriages, all right? So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. You can follow along in our listening guides as well as in our app. And church, today I have three important thoughts for us on how to rebuild and re-strengthen our marriages. At all campuses, are you ready to go to dive into God's Word? Come on, let me hear you at all campuses. Yeah. Amen. Love to hear you ready to go. So write this down as point number one. Here we go. Here's the first thing we need to know. And that is this. A rebuilding your marriage starts with a broken and contrite heart. Now listen to what God's Word says in the book of Nehemiah as he writes. He writes, as I was in Susa, the citadel, the capital... Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, from the land of Israel. 
And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now, folks, stop right there for a moment and, listen, and slip into the scene. Because after the Babylonian captivity, uh, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, began to migrate back to the, to, to the city of Jerusalem little by little. Now, it's been, at this juncture in time, it's been 90 years since the, people, since the Jewish people started going back to the city of Jerusalem. And during this time, a man by the name of Nehemiah was born in Babylon, and he hears about that people are living in Jerusalem again. And so he hears from his brother, obviously, that we just read, right, that the walls of Jerusalem are broken and have, uh, are destroyed by fire, and they're living in great shame. And folks, the moment that Nehemiah hears that, listen to what happens next. And as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and what, church? Wept, Wept and what? Mourned. And mourned for days. And folks, here's what's amazing. Instead of Nehemiah being angry and upset, right? You know, start blaming the people in Jerusalem. How can they be so foolish? How can they're not doing? Look what they've done. They haven't done anything. It's all their fault, right? Nehemiah could have gone on in a huge rant. Instead, what do we see? He sat down, mourned, and wept. And folks, what a lesson for our marriages. Because there are many marriages whose walls have been broken down. And some of us are simply walking around angry and upset and bitter. And all we do is huff and puff about the other person, blaming the other person, angry at the other person. And folks, but here's the thing. There is no brokenness about the condition of the marriage. And so regardless of who's at fault, regardless of who you think is, has most of the blame for the condition of the marriage, listen, there is no sadness and brokenness. And so if you want to start rebuilding, re-strengthening your marriage, right, there has to be a moment that when you look at the condition of your marriage, regardless of who's at fault in your mind, there's a sense of brokenness. There's a sense of sadness about the condition of your marriage. And here's the thing. Once there's brokenness, listen carefully, there is hope. Amen. And here's why. Write this down as big number two. Because, listen, God is committed. He's so committed to rebuild and restore your marriage. Amen? Amen. In fact, listen to what happens next. It says, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his what? Covenant. His covenant. That's, that's important. And steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Now, folks, notice what Nehemiah does. Don't miss this. Because in his prayer, he begins by acknowledging, right, and reaffirming that God is a God who keeps his covenants. In other words, Nehemiah said, Lord, you were the one who made this nation. These are your people. These are the people that, that the, you're, you're, you know, these are the people of your heritage. Lord, you were the ones when, uh, when Abraham, you made that covenant and you created this nation, and these are your people. Lord, I know, I know that you are committed to your people. Amen. And folks, you see, in the same way, as we learned during the first week of this series, if you were here for that, listen, the moment that a man and a woman, right, stand before God in that, at that marriage altar, listen, even though they may be saying, they may recite, be reciting vows at that specific moment, make no mistake about it, God is the one in that moment creating that marriage and creating that covenant, 
And folks, I always want to remind you this, that, that, listen, that God is way more committed to your marriage than even you are. Amen. Listen, even if your feelings have changed, even if circumstances have, have come, are, are different, even if your emotions have changed and you're not all there like you were before, listen carefully, even despite all that, even when both people are not that committed to the marriage, listen carefully, God himself is, is more than committed to your marriage than you can ever imagine. Listen, his commitment to your marriage is unwavering. Can I get an amen to that? You know, early on in my marriage with Ashley, even though things were going great, I remember there was a moment that I began to be a little anxious about the future. And started thinking, you know, like, man, I wonder what's going to come down in 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years down the line. You know, you start thinking about all these different things that could happen in a marriage. And I, and I got to be honest, I, I began to be a little anxious about the future, even though things were going great. And so one day I was reading a book by the, name, by, by the title of The Family Life of a Christian Leader by Ajith Fernando. And folks, this book had a tremendous impact in, uh, in, uh, on me. You know, in the first chapter, he goes on to write how during the planning of a wedding, right, a husband, you know, a, a girl and a boy, they're, they're, they're worried about all these different things leading up to that big day, right? The invitations, the food, the music, you know, all the flowers, all these little di different details. But he says in, his in the first chapter, he writes this. He says, Yet the vows are the key to the marriage. Those few minutes that they're making a vow to each other are extremely important on that day. On that day. They are a part of the covenant that is made that day. Notice what it says. A covenant of which God is the primary partner. And he comes to bless and seal and protect the marriage. And Jesus says that because God joins the couple together, no human being or human agency must ever separate them. This is so even when the persons who have married do not seem to be suited for each other anymore. Once God has joined the couple together, he can provide them with the grace to stay together and develop a good home. Indeed, listen carefully, indeed, the couple may encounter huge problems that seem to be impossible to resolve. But the fact that God has joined them together gives them the confidence. Everyone say confidence. confidence. Everyone say confidence. confidence. Yeah, the confidence that he has the ability to keep them together. They will need to do the hard work to solve their problems, but they can do so with the confidence that if they are obedient to God, God will see them through. Amen? And folks, let me tell you, when I read those words, listen, it was like God put this assurance in my heart that, Omar, no matter what comes down the way, what storms come down your way, what issues, what struggles come your way of you and Ashley, listen, I will be with you. I am going to carry you to the end of your life. And listen carefully, if you're here today, regardless of what's happened in your marriage, listen, regardless of the tears, regardless of the discouragement, of regardless of the hurts, regardless of the change of emotions, listen carefully, your God, your heavenly Father is more committed to your marriage than you can ever imagine. And so you can move forward in your marriage knowing that as long as you seek to honor God, as long as you seek to obey God, God is for you and he will lead you in the way that you should go. Can you praise God today for that? Now, folks, you may be wondering, well, okay, Omar, I... I I'm glad to hear that God is committed to me, but, but Omar, do I have a part in it? Well, folks, write this down as big number three. Listen, of course, you have a part in rebuilding and strengthening your marriage. And folks, here is the first part. Here's the first step. If you want to rebuild, if you want to re-strengthen, here's the first step in doing so. Write this down as letter A. Listen, the first step is to acknowledge 
your sins and failures in the marriage. Amen. Now, folks, listen to what Nehemiah says next in his prayer. He says this. He says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, Lord, to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the what? Sin. The sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I, and this key, don't miss this, even I in my father's house have what? Sin. Have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. And family, here's what I want to highlight about this. Not only does Nehemiah, right, confess the sins of the people of God, right? But more importantly, listen carefully, he then goes on to confess his own sins. Notice, even though he's not living in Jerusalem, notice that even though he did not have a direct part at that juncture, right, of what the conditions of the wall, he began by confessing his own sins before God. Listen carefully. If the first step in rebuilding your marriage is that you have to take the moment and acknowledge your own sins and failures, in the marriage. Now, the moment that I made that point, if you're thinking, man, I'm glad he's touching, that, uh, touching on this. Man, I hope she's listening. I hope he's listening. Preach it, Omar. Come on. Preach it now. He needs to hear this. He, she needs to hear this. Listen. If that's what you began to think, listen, that I'm talking to you. Amen. I'm talking to you. Listen, not them. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. Because I cannot tell you how many people come to me with a broken marriage throughout the years. And folks, get this. I have to listen for about an hour, yeah, of them complaining and telling me why she's so bad, why he's so terrible. Look what she's done. Look what he's done. Look what she didn't do. Look what he didn't do. And all these things on and on and on. And they spend the entire conversation when they meet with me telling me how terrible the other person is. But you know what usually never happens? That someone that comes to me with marriage trouble sits down in front of me and begins to tell me from the, from the get-go, man, here's how I've failed in the marriage. Here's how I've messed up. Listen, other than a gross, you know, moral sin, right? When it's just marriage issues, I rarely have anybody, if, right, come to me and start off the conversation saying, man, I failed this way. I've messed up. I've done this and that that I know that I should not have done in the marriage. And so... Get this, listen, you want to know what the hard work of a pastor is in the middle of marriage counseling? I'll tell you. It's getting a person to a point that they stop accusing the other person of how terrible they are and have them embrace the fact that they've also made mistakes in the marriage. That they've also uh, had blunders in the marriage. That they've also sinned in the marriage. So the hard work of a pastor, right, in the middle of marriage counseling is to get them from stopping just pointing the finger at them and start pointing the finger at themselves. Listen, regardless of who you think has the most significant part of the blame in the condition of the marriage, which, by the way, from every angle is different, right? But even if you think, right, even if you think that the other person has the most fault in the condition of the marriage, listen, if you are serious about rebuilding your marriage, re-strengthening your marriage, then you have, there has to be a point in your life where you start acknowledging 
how you have failed, how you have stumbled, how you have sinned in the marriage. Amen. See, only when that's present does God really begin to rebuild. You know, you know, a, a, a while back I was, um, I was counseling a couple and it was, if I could admit, it was pretty much the hardest marriage issue I've had to deal with. Uh, and, you know, this couple came to me and what took place was that the woman had been unfaithful. She committed adultery. And as a result of that adulterous relationship, she was now pregnant from that. And so she came to me and um, they both came to me. And so uh, you can imagine the hurt and how difficult and the complexities of this issue. And I remember one day I just sat down shortly thereafter with the gentleman and we just began to talk and the moment that I that we started he did something that I did not expect I was expecting him to start blaming her and saying things about her and all these different things but you know what he did he stopped and he began to, to, to share with me how he thinks he's failed in the marriage what are the mistakes that he made in the marriage and he just began to talk to me about the things that God had convicted him of. And folks, listen carefully. The moment that I heard him say those things, which, by the way, uh, he was not, no one was minimizing the actions of the other person, right? No one was minimizing those actions. But when I saw that's where he was at, I knew that this is the fertile ground for God to begin to rebuild. And let me tell you, God was faithful, and today they are as healthy as ever together to this day. Amen? And so listen, if you right now, if you want to rebuild your marriage, if you want to strengthen your marriage, listen, you have to come to a point where you put your pride aside and you stop pointing at the other person and you let God convict you of what you've done in the marriage. Because let me tell you, rarely if ever, we're, you're both sinful people in a marriage. And both people make mistakes and there's issues on both sides. But if you're able to come to the point that you say, you know what, I need to acknowledge what I've done in, my, in the marriage. And listen, that is fertile ground for God to rebuild. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. And listen, second of all, not only acknowledge, but also write this down, letter B, Listen, listen carefully for your own failures and sins. And the reason I say that is because there are times, don't miss this, that sometimes we're not even aware of the things, that, of the ways that we've hurt the other person. And so there has to be a moment, right, that you stop and you listen to your spouse. Because whether you really didn't do that, what they're saying, or maybe you did it, but you were not intentionally doing that, Regardless of what's going on, get, get this, at the end of the day, they're feeling a certain way. And so you cannot move forward, right, unless you hear your spouse and you're able to address it and acknowledge, right, of the fact that, wow, they're feeling this way. And sometimes, right, we don't want to hear the other person, but we need to listen to see what exactly is that they're feeling because oftentimes we don't even realize that we're hurting the person with a word, with a, an action, with whatever the case may be. There has to be moments, right, where you stop and you listen. And so once you've owned your mistakes and your failures, once you've heard from your spouse of how they're feeling, then write this down, let her see. Then you need to say the three hardest words in a marriage. Please forgive me. I'm sorry, forgive me, Right? Because if you read, keep reading in Nehemiah's prayer, towards the end of that prayer, he says, Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us. Rebuild, Lord. Have mercy on us. And let me tell you something. I don't know what it is, but asking for forgiveness in a marriage, say I'm sorry in a marriage, sometimes it's the hardest three words to say in a marriage. Have you noticed that? We can get into fights and arguments, but it's so hard to say, I'm sorry. In fact, the way that it usually works, right, is that you don't talk to each other for a couple hours, a couple days, and then you keep walking, you know, you, you, you avoid each other, and then you go into a room, 
that you, the other person's at, and you start, you know, acknowledging, you know, things that don't, you know, just small talk to see if we've moved past, right, the issue, right? <laughs> right? We just start talking, you know, you know, it's like, is, is the milk so white? Okay, yeah, it's so white, okay. You know, we can, yeah, we, all right, and then you start, okay, we, we're moved past forward, but you know what usually doesn't happen? We don't say I'm sorry to each other. We don't say forgive me for what I've done to you, right? And so let me tell you something. Those words, forgive me, I'm sorry, even though they're the hardest words to utter in a marriage, let me tell you something, it's also the most healing words in a marriage. You know, the, the, listen, the moment that you, acknowledge, that you say, I'm sorry, forgive me for what I've, the way I've hurt you, for what I've done, for my failures, the moment you say those words, listen, it doesn't mean that, that the past is erased and, you know, it, like it never happened. No, but here's what happens. You cannot move forward if those words are not uttered. Why? Because those words are like a healing ointment in the wounds of a marriage. See, when you really hear, when the other person hears that you, you're owning your mistakes and you say, I'm sorry, and you're broken and you're contrite, it's like God uses those words as a healing ointment so that you can strengthen and start rebuilding your marriage. But listen, you cannot rebuild, you cannot re-strengthen if there's never a moment where you say those words, I'm sorry, please forgive me for what I've done. Amen? And then, write this down, it's letter D. Listen, say the next three hardest words in a marriage. I forgive you. I forgive you. In fact, listen to what God's word says in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Be put away from your marriage along with all malice. Be kind to each other. Be kind to your spouse, tender-hearted. Notice, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Listen, if you want to rebuild your marriage, listen, it takes courage for the other person, right, to acknowledge and ask for forgiveness. Listen, you do your part and you say, man, I forgive you. You see, you cannot rebuild a marriage if there's never a moment that you forgive that person. See, forgiveness means instead of retaliating and, getting, and, and giving them what, in your mind, they deserve, it means putting away that wrath, putting away that anger, putting away that bitterness, and being kind to each other, being tender-hearted to each other. Oh, but you don't understand. You don't understand what they did to me. Oh, I can never forgive them. Oh, I can, I, I, can, I, I can never forgive them for what they've done. You don't know what's happened throughout the years. You don't know what's happened throughout the decades. I could never, never, ever forgive them. Listen carefully. If you are a child of God, your heavenly Father is telling you to forgive them. Listen, remember what the verse says. It says, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Listen, whatever list you have, you've written down that you feel that they've done against you, your list before God is way longer. Whatever you think bad they've done to you, you have done gr gr infinitely worse to God. And so there has to be a point that you say, you know what, if I'm going to rebuild, I need to forgive and that's not calling back the past. That's not, you know, saying things about, no. There has to be a moment, yes. I'm not saying that that's erased, that can never happen. But there has to be a moment, right? Right? There has to be a moment that at that, at that, at, at that moment, you're able to tell them, listen, I forgive you. And you move forward. And you start building up what the enemy has brought down. Amen? And then lastly, write this down to letter E. Listen. Start obeying God regardless of what they do. You see, folks, from here on out, you need to start, right, after you've offered forgiveness, you've said, I'm, I'm forgive me, 
and I'm sorry, there's reconciliation. From that moment on, you want to rebuild, you want to put the bricks of your marriage back, start obeying God as a husband. Start obeying God as a wife, regardless of whether they obey. See, for so many people, they're like, well, you know, Omar, I'm, you know, I'm not going to honor them. I'm not going to love them. No, you know, if I do that and they don't do it, they're going to walk all over me, and I'm not going to let it happen. But listen carefully. If you want to rebuild, you have to start obeying God regardless of whether they are obeying God or not. Yeah. Right? Your relationship, right, our command from God is not with a caveat if the other person is obeying. God's command to us is for our good, regardless of what anybody else does. And let me tell you something. It is in those moments that maybe perhaps they're not obeying God, but you stay obeying God. Usually that's when the Lord works the most in their heart. Let me tell you something. It's kind of hard to continue being, doing certain things when you see the other person obeying and honoring the Lord. And so listen. I know it's not easy at times, but there has to be those moments that even when that person, the tone changes, they say certain things, you stay firm and you start obeying God and you'll see that God little by little will start putting the pieces of your marriage back together. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah. And so folks, let me end with this. You know, today, uh, you know, we're ending a, a short little three-week marriage search, but this is not the end. You know, whether you are married, you feel like you're strong, you're doing great. Uh, maybe in your marriage you feel like, man, you know what, we need a little tune-up in our marriage. So we always need a little tune-up for our marriage. Or maybe you're not in a good place in your marriage. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. You're, you're, the first next step I'm going to give you is very simple. Is attend our marriage seminar on April 19th and 20th. Right? Uh, in this seminar, listen, we're all coming together. It's going to be a great, great time. For us to come, it's going to be Friday night and Saturday morning. We're moved it to the Palmetto Bay campus so that, so that we have as much room for people to come. If you feel like you need help or you want to make, your, make sure that your marriage is as strong as possible, I want to encourage you, come to the marriage seminar. There is a, 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 uh, a fee just to cover the dinner and the, the breakfast and snacks and all the cool things that we're going to do for you all. Uh, so there's a fee, which, by the way, if for whatever reason you cannot afford it, listen, we don't want that to be a barrier for you to come. You let us know, and we will figure out a way for to get you here. But the, the key is, listen, our marriages are the most important relationship in this earth. After God, our marriages are the most really important relationship. Because when our marriages are strong, our families will be strong. Everything is impacted the moment that your relationship is right, right? If you want to be good parents, you know where you start off? On your marriage. Make sure your marriage is as strong as it could be. And so we're going to be covering some really great topics in this seminar. For example, the first session, if we can put those up, the first session is going to be uh, on the theology of marriage. So we need to, you know, understand from God's word, what are the theological implications of a marriage? Second of all, it's all about communication. Uh, so how to communicate better in a marriage. Uh, third is intimacy, right, how that's an important component of a marriage. And the last but not least is what we call the energizing cycle, which is love and respect, right? What a husband needs most is respect and honor, and what a wife needs most is love, is tender love, right? So we're going to be talking about this, but I want to encourage you, listen, if you feel, if you're a couple here at CF, man, we would love, love to have you with us. Uh, in fact, here's what I'm going to ask. If you're married um, today, go ahead and take out your phone for just a moment. I want you to have the info with you. Go ahead and take out your phone. And if you don't mind, go ahead and take out your phone. I know you, some of you have been on it all sermon long, right? Yeah. <laughs> So go ahead and take out the phone and just open the camera app. And when you, when you, when you, when you scan that, you'll see, that the, you'll see a little link. You can go to the web page with more information. And then also, if that's not working for whatever reason, just go to cfmiami.org slash marriage. And there's also the, 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 the link to that. Um, and so I want to encourage you, take the time, whether now or after service, to re register before seats are sold out. I w we want the best for you. And also a reminder, this Thursday night, at 8 p.m., we're going to be having a Q&A for all the questions that you guys have been submitting uh, throughout this series. And we're going to be answering those questions online. So be sure to tune in at 8 p.m. this uh, Thursday night on YouTube and, and our main social media uh, and our main webpage. 
Then, so here's the second step. You know, I mentioned this last week. I hope that you have been doing this. But the second step that I want to encourage you to do on a daily basis, okay, is very simple. At the end of every night, go with your spouse in your room, turn the TV off, turn the phones off, hold hands with your spouse, and pray. Pray out loud. Pray uh, Pray about your marriage. Pray about the things that are going on. Pray for whatever the Lord puts in your heart that day. Both of you, you pray together. You, the husband prays, the woman prays out loud. And listen, I told you last week, I know sometimes it may be very awkward at first. It's okay. It may be a little awkward the second night. It's okay. But let me tell you, the more you do it, listen, the easier it's going to be. And I am telling you, the moment that a husband and a wife who are believers in God go to God for blessings upon their marriage, for protection of their marriage, for wisdom, let me tell you something. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. And so listen, you want to keep your marriage healthy? Listen, yeah, if you want to keep your marriage healthy, go before the Lord. Don't be going on separate roads with the Lord. Come together, right, and approach Him. And, it's, and, and I'm telling you, God begins... To rebuild. And like I said last week, if you've been fighting a lot, it's kind of be nasty in a fight and argument when you just prayed just a few hours before, right? And so listen, there's something about prayer that I want to challenge you. Let that be part of your marriage. It will make a tremendous difference in a marriage. Amen. So here's how I want to end this series. And it's with a prayer of commitment to fight for your marriage. And so in a, few, in a few moments, I'm going to open up the altar at all campuses, the front of the stage, okay? And if you feel like your marriage is great, uh, maybe if you feel like your marriage could do a little, use a little work, a little tune-up, or maybe like your marriage is, is struggling, or maybe you're by yourself here and your, man, and your spouse is not here, but you feel like you want to be able to pray. So I'm going to open up the front now as a band plays in a few moments. I'm going to ask, I'm encourage you just to come to the front at all campuses, come to the front. Kneel down with your spouse and, uh, and just start, begin to pray. Just, just quietly just, just start praying for your marriage. I'm going to also pray over our marriages. And I'm going to pray that God puts this, this strong commitment in our hearts, right, to fight for our marriages and to make them the best that it could be. Because what do we learn today? God is committed to our marriages, right? So if you want God to work in your marriage, it starts with you humbling yourself before the Lord coming for him say lord bless our marriage solidify our marriage so that we can honor you in our relationship okay and so i'm you know i'm going to ask you now if you're married and a couple if you feel led to men come to the front at all campuses you can go and make um, you can stand up if you're married start coming to the front um if it starts getting just way too crowded the front you can kneel wherever you're at uh in, in but but start coming down and listen if you want god to bless your marriage it's a moment for you to come broken before god and we're going to pray for our marriages, okay? This is my wife, Ashley. We're going to pray as well with you, all right? So at all campus, go ahead and start moving to the front and come. And just take a moment just to say, Lord, man, we love you, Lord. And uh, Lord, bless our marriage. You wanted to honor you in our marriage. So start coming to the front at all campuses. If you're not able physically, do not worry. You can kneel or you can stay in your seat. But make sure you pray as well. So come to the front at all campuses now. I'm going to give you a few moments as you kneel down just to talk to your Heavenly Father and pray for your marriage. So I'm going to give you a few moments to pray for your marriage now. And Lord, we come before you, O oh God, and Lord, you see the hearts, you see the souls of every single couple, Lord, that you've joined together, O oh God. You've seen that you declared us to be one, Lord. So Father, you see that, you see the condition of your marriage, you see the truth of what's going on in their marriage. And so Father, I pray, first of all, for a blessing upon them, O oh God. Lord, if they're kneeling down before you, Lord, look down upon your children, oh God. 
and see their humbleness or brokenness and, Lord, their desire to be blessed by their Heavenly Father, God. I pray, oh God, that you would bless them, oh Lord. Father, I pray right now that you put a strong commitment in their hearts to fight for their marriage. Lord, the enemy has had his way with many of our marriages, but Father, we know that in you there is victory, that you have a better plan, that in you we can rebuild strong. And so Father, I pray, oh God, for all of our marriages, regardless of the condition, whether they're good or not so good, regardless of the Lord, that you put a firm commitment in all of our hearts, that even though marriage is hard, God, that we will fight for marriages, oh God. I pray for a commitment, for brokenness, for those of us right now who are not broken before you, Lord, I pray for that your spirit would convict and that you would break their hearts for their marriage and that you put a desire in them to want to pursue and honor you. And Father, as we move forward as a church, Father, give us the grace, give us the wisdom, give us the guidance, give us the self-control to be able to be the husband and wife that you're calling us to be so that we could, could, could see a victory in our marriage. Because Father, we know that ultimately, because of what you did at the cross, our marriages are not doomed for failure. Our marriages could be rebuilt to be God honoring for you. And so Lord, thank you, God, that we're not alone. Thank you, Lord, that you are committed to us. And we commit ourselves now to honoring you. I pray for a blessing over us. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And all of God's people say, amen, amen.